Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Cecilia magnussen Sjöberg to you today. Uh, Cecilia is Subject Director of Law and Information Technology at Stockholm University in Sweden. Uh, she was awarded an LLD degree in 1992 with a doctoral thesis addressing legal automation with special focus on computerization and public administration. So therefore, Cecilia is one of those who have been working with computers and law now for really, really many years. Legal implications of e-government still remain one of her major fields of work. So more than 30 years of experience in in this field from an academic point, but also from a practical point um, of view. In addition to substantive com components of IT law, such as in particular privacy protection, she has had many years of experience of legal system design and management, giving rise to information security issues and the need for electronic signatures, et cetera. So just like many others from this generation, including myself, if I may say so, uh, Cecilia also combines a legal approach and then in particular an IT law approach with a more technical approach, which one would call today uh, more perhaps something which is named uh, legal informatics or, or legal tech. She, she has both of the qualifications um, ongoing and working in the, both of these. In addition to a wide variety of research projects addressing the interplay between law and modern information communication technologies, she is also practically and politically involved in the sense that she is engaged by the Swedish government chairing public inquiries about inter alia personal data protection for research purposes and how to legally facilitate the digitalization of the public sector. So again, an IT point of view and a legal point of view and within the legal point of view in, in particular privacy and information security law point of view. Cecilia, it's really a great pleasure and honor to have you with us. How are you today and how is the situation in Sweden at the moment? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me uh, in this very interesting series of interviews. Much appreciated and also your kind presentation on my profile. And uh, I do agree that it is the interplay between law and, and uh, system management that is um, truly interesting and inspiring. Uh, the situation in Sweden uh, with regard to the Corona crisis, um, coronavirus. It's it's very difficult for me to 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 say to describe. Um, it's a very sad situation. Uh, the um, number of deaths over five thousand five thousand four hundred something. Um, the situation for Sweden in comparison with the Nordic countries. It's 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 very difficult to summarize and to grasp. Uh, the situation with regard to elderly care, elderly people and their home uh, is also difficult to, to, to understand. So lots of questions, lots of uh, exclamation marks. Uh, why, uh, why, why not did that uh, taken care of, etc. There is just one positive thing. And one positive thing is that the Swedish government has has decided um, and about um, a, um, a commission public inquiry that is going to be chaired by a Supreme Court uh, judge, uh, but that that it might help in the long term perspective. But I do not have any e explanation. Uh, it's unbelievable the way in public authorities, the lack of political decisiveness there is. There are so many questions and there are many people involved trying to explain, but we, the curves are to some extent going down, but we're still in the very midst of the Corona crisis and extreme crisis in Sweden. It's sad and it's also quite delicate politically, scientifically, etc. cetera. Yeah. So, yeah. And when it comes to your situation as a university teacher, you are uh, you are teaching from home, I assume, and students are not allowed to enter campus, or, or are they? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's correct. This was this uh, immediate transformation from one day to another that campus closed for the students, and we as employees, as staff, we were not allowed. 
unless there was ex an extreme exception to, to, to pick up material or something like that. But just over a night, um, the uh, teaching activity was transformed into uh, remote uh, digital teaching, all kinds, seminars, lectures. Uh, we were lucky within the field of law and informatics because we've had digital home exams for quite a few years. So we had that prepared, so to speak. But there was this um, extreme um, shift over more or less just one night. And, and the message was just, you just, was just fix it. Just uh, mm -hmm. make it happen uh, safely from a health perspective and also see that the students uh, receive the credits that they can expect. And this is still the situation at the moment. So um, students yep. off campus, uh, um, exams off campus and uh, situation for autumn unclear. Uh, the um, management of the department and university, Stockholm University on the whole has actually presented a time plan saying that by 1st of September, we as staff, we are allowed to um, enter the campus uh, provided we do not use any public transport. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after yet another month, the plan is that half staff um, can visit a campus physically one day and then the other half the other, so as to minimize the number of people at the same place. Uh, and, but in terms of lectures, no lectures in physical um, lecture halls, everything digital. And uh, a decision has been made that Zoom is the tool that we are supposed to use mm -hmm. with all these advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, and, and, and students then, I mean, uh, I mean, you have now probably one term of experience with this. Do you have the feeling that the students are well connected with the university at the moment? Or is, is there any major impact uh, on, on the interaction between students and teachers that you see? Well, of course, there, are, there is, um, I mean, the, the definitely impact and uh, uh, I just received actually uh, a decision by the head of the department that one of our seminars concerning information security that we've had as a role play scenario based uh, that we also used to grade uh, that we're not going to grade that seminar we're going to have we're going to say parts of fail because we do not think that we can uh, grade uh, the students contributions in an adequate way so yes definitely mm. so so um um quite a few decisions laying down exceptions with relation in relation to otherwise governing documents yeah university mm. yeah perhaps if i may ask uh, such a very stupid question how is the the how are the studies if you want to become a lawyer in sweden organized in principle so how many right. years does it take um what do you need to do um in order to achieve which academic grade what are you expected to do then if you want to become a practical lawyer or as an academic etc could you give me kindly a very brief yeah. Overview. <laughs> a very brief overview is yeah. that uh, you need to graduate from uh, high school and mm -hmm. then you need to study law for four and a half years. Mm -hmm. So we say that three, uh, three years is the, under, is the undergraduate and then another one and a half years as a kind of master's level. So uh, in order to become a professional lawyer, Mm -hmm. um, you need to study law four and a half years. And then the first three years are more funda fundamental. And then the uh, later part, you can study um, special, special courses. Uh, what's quite interesting possibly is that uh, at Stockholm University, law and informatics is a, a mandatory compulsory topic area. So you cannot become a lawyer graduating from Stockholm University without having without having studied law and informatics uh, for weeks and being graded in that part. And then you have uh, the possibility of special courses, uh, cyber law, uh, IT law, writing your exam paper. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lawyer to become an advocate, you need to uh, have a number of clients and you have some other um, uh, qualifications required and that applies also if you want to become a judge you need to study uh, you need to uh, practice at the court for two years but professionally to become a lawyer four and a half years at a yeah. university and that's not fully in line with the Bologna system or is it 
is it a shortened version of Bologna or how would we you think qualify this? <laughs> we think it's a fully adequate uh, Bologna compliance. Okay. Because mm -hmm. of the three years plus one and a half as compulsory. That's our okay. stand. Okay. So you do a bachelor after three years and then the master after one and a half. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And all in all, it's, it's compulsory with four and a half years. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And in the first three years in the bachelor, studies are organized in, in the traditional way, meaning there are subjects on public law and, and subjects on civil law and, and others on criminal law. And then there are some add-ons such as law and informatics. And general jurisprudence. Exactly. So we mm -hmm. have all the conventional topic areas. Uh, and you can see that there is a growing interest in such topics like uh, international private law um, and public law. I mean, the core components are still are still the core uh, components of, of the legal education. But what is new, relatively, not new really, because we began teaching law and informatics beginning of the 80s. But I think what makes Stockholm University, if I may so, uh, say so, unique is that it is compulsory for approximately 200, 200, well, more than 200 students to actually study law and informatics yeah. and at what? their semester, seventh semester. Okay, so that means in more or less their, their last year of Bachelor studies. Uh, actually, no, the that's the first the year of master studies. Then, okay. exactly, yes. Okay, advanced and, level. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And what do you teach there? What is the the purpose um, of this or the goal? Well, the goal is to convey law and informatics that it's important to to uh, both work with substantive IT law issues, but also legal system management. Mm -hmm. And we have three different blocks. One block is, is about um, the, the whole area of law and IT and the internationalization of, of, of law uh, and data protection as, as a basis for further studies in the second block, mm -hmm. uh, uh, during which we um, teach um, legal automation, um, the use of, well, coding law, uh, designing algorithms, automatic decision making, mm -hmm. uh, AI implications, etc. And then we have a third block, which is uh, about information security, legal implications of information security. Mm -hmm. And we have associated seminars. So it's, it's, it's um, yeah, that's the core components. And is it well accept, accepted among the students or do they, or and among the faculty, is this something uh, that gets sufficient support to be extended or is it uh, like this now for 30 years? How did that evolve? Mm. Well, uh, now nowadays, I'm happy to say that the topic area, law and informatics, is in fact very popular. Believe it or not, I think that GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, has really helped us um, uh, from a pedagogical point of view to show how important it is to let law uh, play a, a proactive role and the uh, I mean, you can find almost everything, anything in, in the GDPR. So that has been, um, uh, has helped us to explain why also from a legal point of view, it is important um, to, to um, uh, analyze and, and work with legal system management. But it didn't, it wasn't like that from the beginning because then it was, well, computers, we are, we are gonna become lawyers. We don't, we don't want to do mathematics or structuring or programming, et cetera. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks mm -hmm. to GDPR. So that's interesting because this is a success story of GDPR that I have not heard before. I right? saw so that it's, it, it helps in, in making uh, the uh, students understand mm -hmm. that the subject is of interest. Okay. Uh, yeah. And, and students then, I mean, in, in the master, in the two years of master studies, they have the, the opportunity to specialize in different areas. And one of them would be something like legal informatics and another ITL one. Or we yeah. Okay. Sorry, we have one IT law, which is a, a special course running 10 weeks, uh, and it's um, given in, in Swedish primarily. And then we have another 10 weeks course, cyber law, which is in English and more international. Yeah. And then students may also write their exam paper, which uh, uh, comprises um, a, a term that is six months of studies. Okay. And one, one thing that's quite interesting is to, because you did touch upon the colleagues and our colleagues, mm -hmm. my colleagues and their interest. And to some extent, it's, it's interesting to, uh, to, I mean, quite a few are quite enthusiastic and, uh, and quite a few of my colleagues are also primarily interested in uh, possibly the conventional substantive law issues, but the legal system management, the privacy by design, those uh, when, when you analyze different kinds of algorithms, I think that's still 
quite specialized. Yeah, yeah. And um, do, do, you, do you have the impression that anything here changed due to COVID-19 and the way we teach now and the way we, we do research and organize our work um, at universities? Yes, um, absolutely. And in preparing to some extent this interview, I, I thought, well, what would, what, what would I like to touch upon? And I mean, I just think about the three, three different um, components. I mean, what do we do at the university? We do research, we, we, uh, ed we engage in education teaching, of course, mm -hmm. and also the surrounding society. And, and, and I think a starting point is that the coronavirus really shows how important it is to combine uh, substantive law issues. You need to consider GDPR from, from a crisis perspective, GDPR, the principle of openness, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. given the very sad situation or the, the, um, well, the situation in Sweden, um, our principle of openness dating back to 1766, providing anyone to have access to official documents that are public. Uh, journalists have tried to get hold of, so to speak, uh, official documents with reference to the Swedish principle of publicity, but has been denied with reference to data about actions taken, actions not taken. It's referred to as personal, personal data that falls uh, under the confidentiality uh, um, framework. So if you, you can make the list quite long about uh, the coronavirus and how it implies, has implications for substantive law. GDPR is just one example. And then again, also the legal system management. I mean, we need to think even more, I would say, about information security. So it's it's more, there, there is need, I would say that there is a need for more law and informatics that uh, the corona crisis, the corona situation emphasizes the, the need for that mm -hmm. uh, to a greater extent. Yeah. And um, sorry, go ahead. If I may just say one more thing about the um, the research situation, if I may share with you, mm -hmm. um, kind of a case, but not the court case, but a, a research case. Um, in in um, in February 2019, I I was uh, asked to write a report about eHealth, eHealth as an app, data data protection and data sharing, and I was willing to do that. There was a well-known think tank that asked me to write a report and I started doing that, uh, investigating into GDPR, information security, patient data and all that that char characterizes um, e-health. Mm -hmm. And the report was supposed to be launched um, April. I mean, it was supposed to be launched in the midst of the corona crisis. Mm -hmm. So I've been working uh, with a project for, for quite some time uh, outside of the scoop of, of Corona, no one could, it was impossible to envisage what was to come. And uh, as a researcher, uh, as an individual, as a researcher, it felt, to be very honest, it felt like, what's the point? Here I am sitting, digging into some, some article, some, some recital in the European Union government, um, uh, a legal act of some some kind and and what's the point when 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 I saw everything just around me breaking mm -hmm. down but then after some time I realized well actually it's the other way around it's 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 really the environment with the, the the outburst of corona that made it even more important to discuss the legal implications of of apps uh, of, of different kinds, apps for, for traceability, apps for control of, of um, spreading, et cetera, uh, apps in order to replace physical meetings, uh, replacing that with uh, video meetings, mm -hmm. and, and also the, the need for uh, law to be um, proactive, ready for the challenges, instead of saying that we'll, we'll solve the problems when they come. So what I learned as a researcher is how extraordinary important timing is with what, we, with what goes on in the surrounding society and, and how I, what was embarrassing, I felt there's no point in doing this research because the crisis takes means everything, but that's of course not true. It's a combination of what the normal society and, and then what um, emerged uh, in the corona society. But it was a challenge personally to 
rewrite to some extent my hypothesis in in the in the project to to shift focus, be aware of what was going on in from the crisis point of view. So that was a a, a journey as a researcher, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, perhaps to to go a little bit deeper into this, I mean, if you if you if you needed to start an academic career today, and you you identified this as your area of expertise, and you want and and this is what you want to work on, let's call it legal informatics in the traditional sense. What would be the right approach to do this? You would probably need first to write a PhD after four and a half years of studies. Mm. And would you and 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 would it be an appropriate step to write a PhD in such a specialized topic, or would you be expected to write it in one of the traditional fields first and then specialize a little bit later? You mean uh, I'm not sure I follow 100. Uh, I mean the, a combination of the crisis perspective or. No, I mean, it's a very, at the moment, it's just a very general question. How do you mm. become an academic in Sweden with a specific focus in a given area of law, which is new, such as the one okay. that we are talking about? And then whether this has changed or will change due to the crisis. I, th I think one, one reflection is that prior the coronavirus in Sweden, there was so much focus on AI mm. uh, and, and artificial intelligence, not only from the tech side, of things but also within the legal domain and there there i mean so that was it is it's not it didn't emerge as a new field because we'll be we both we know that we have the the wave the ai wave during the 80s with the rule based ai based decision making so we we, we experience ai to, to, in in a, a more modern ai no doubt and there was so much so many discussions and everybody everybody wants to to work with algorithms so that was really on top of the research agenda uh but uh now i well possibly as a result of the corona um ai in the legal domain is, is not that the discussions is not that not that um uh, intense mm -hmm. um, and the corona the crisis perspective relevant uh, but I would if I were to advise uh, a young student or a student a junior to that wants to do research I would say go for the information security bit information security which of course um, comprises also uh, crisis aspects and how you merge the crisis situation with the what we up till now anyway has thought of as being the the the, the normal society mm -hmm. so uh, what does that boil down to yes the yeah. interaction of information security and the crisis perspective definitely but wouldn't that be a very i mean in in a german speaking university that would probably be a very risky career choice because it would expect a lot of uh, knowledge in information technology and at the same time, it would be seen as a very, still would be seen as a very strange area of legal expertise. So uh, if, if I were a young risk avoiding German academic, I would try to write a PhD somewhere in, I don't know, traditional civil law, law of contracts or something like this. And then try to keep as open as possible for quite a long time mm -hmm. and then try to dig into something in a later stage of my career. So that's that would be different in Sweden, I assume. Then yes, I think yes. it would be different uh, in in Sweden and also mm. in ah, uh, in spite of the Corona, our neighbour friends in Norway, Finland, and Denmark. Mm. I do think we have quite a strong tradi tradition in the Nordic countries. Uh, in spite of having to, when I work with my doctoral uh, thesis, I need to, I needed, sorry to say, uh, just to study quite a lot of German literature. Mm. Um, because in the, the culture was uh, was quite impressive, very advanced comparatively. But uh, no, I, I would say that uh, we have quite a few doctoral students. So law and informatics, Rechtsinformatik, uh, is definitely accepted now. So I don't think that would be risky research mm -hmm. to go for the legal information uh, information security, for instance, but it's important. I, I in that uh, perspective, I do agree that it's still important to have your roots in 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 a traditional field, be it civil law or be it administrative law, uh, 
because you still need the, the, the core components. But then if you add on in terms of an interdisciplinary approach, the, the uh, for instance, information security or uh, certain aspects of data, data protection, and of course, legal automation, automated decision-making, different kinds of algorithms. But yes, I agree that you need to have the conventional platform, but there is, I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider it a risky business to add on legal informatics, but it should be a good project. I mean, it should be, it should be a smart approach, not just yeah. a descriptive uh, overview of something. Okay, and if you if you have such a good and smart project, and you write your PhD, and it, it's an excellent PhD, uh, you are qualified as an academic for the academic legal market then in Sweden and in the Nordic countries. Yes, and there is there is a labor market for those people, so it's it's an acceptable choice for somebody who is now finishing his law or her law studies at the moment to say, I want to become a professor of law and informatics in 15 years. And that's why I start to write a smart, feed, smart PhD at the moment. And that has not <laughs> changed due to Corona or has it? <laughs> um, I think what uh, Corona brings, Corona brings uh, to the open the need for uh, understanding tech, legal tech, what, what, I mean, how can you enter a, a discussion about e-health as an app without understanding certain conditions for who does what under different circumstances? Sorry, but, Cecilia, may I ask you a very stupid question, but one that I receive very often on this would okay. be, okay, so if, if it's true that uh, you can't, I mean, is it true that you need this kind of specialization because everything is becoming tech in a way, or everything is becoming digital. Mm -hmm. So why not the civil lawyers or the administrative lawyers or the criminal lawyers now also doing, uh, you know, legal tech um, mm -hmm. and civil law, criminal law, and so on. Mm -hmm. So what would you answer to this? I would say, I would argue that there is a need for specialized studies or legal infrastructures. Uh, it's not for just any, uh, excellent scholar to dig into different kinds of algorithms. For instance, discussions about how can you in any way accomplish transparency, openness using uh, machine learning. I mean, this is the conventional example nowadays, but it's still valid. How can you do that? How can you discuss algorithms with techies without understanding the differences between dynamic algorithms and the more deterministic ones, for instance? And what kind of transparency, in what ways? How do you approach, for instance, Article 15 and other articles in GDPR? Uh, how, what is what is legally meant by explainability as opposed to technical explainability? So. My, my instant reaction is that no, you, you still need legal tech. You still need legal, well, lawyers, mm -hmm. not being techies necessarily, but uh, being able to discuss, have having a dialogue about different kind of tech solutions. And would you say that this is a contested position, or is this common sense at your university? <laughs> Uh, it it varies. Uh, I would say nowadays that it's 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 uh, it's definitely uh, relevant. It's some some colleagues, some scholars, are, however, um, provoked, if I may say so, by bringing in legal aspects into the legal domain, the traditional domain. It's like, okay, are we going to have, our, maybe tomorrow we'll wake up and we're going to have a new law about toothbrush. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you, if you explain and if you, mm -hmm. I think we, we have now so much evidence about the importance of, you can call it substantive act law, the legal system management, the legal tech business. Um, and mm -hmm. there are also quite a lot of IT law professionals wanting to, to understand more about law. And that's that's yet another task explaining law to, to tech. I mean, confidentiality, do we mean secrecy legislation or confidentiality in a contract? Integrity, for instance. Mm -hmm. do, we don't mean our privacy, but by integrity in the security context, we want to, to address the correctness of data, et cetera. So there are quite a lot of um, need, needs for, for, for communication between different professional rules. 
Yeah. And is this also true for the practical labor market? So do you think that for a young person wishing to become um, a, an advocate in the field, that that would also be an appropriate choice at the moment? Um, Unfortunately, because that means that we have quite a, quite a few very good doctoral students that disappear into the commercial market and also uh, to other um, public, public agencies. Mm -hmm. So there is a constant demand of our doctoral students. So that is a problem for us. Yeah. And why is this? Because uh, tenure is coming too late or payment is too low in academia or...? Both. Both. Okay. Okay. So when is tenure coming in, a, in an average career? Uh, I would say, well, you do four and a half years and then another five years for a dissertation and then uh, postdoc three years and then, you're, um, then you can apply. Okay. So that means that you are something mid thirties in your mid thirties, if you're 40 or 35, 40, yeah. 35 to 40. Okay. Yeah. And, and you are not necessarily expected to write a second book, or are you? In order to become a professor, I mean, there's one thing. I mean, we have you, you become a doctor and then docent. Mm -hmm. I don't know, that would be associate. Yeah. yeah. And then lecturer okay. and senior lecturer. So and to have a permanent position, I mean, that's the goal as such, not necessarily where on the ladder you are, are positioned. Yeah. yeah. And that would expect you need to write a second book, but there is no second exam or something or, no. or, or formal procedure. It's just a book. Okay. Exile. Okay. Okay. What we see also is quite a lot of money being transferred via, as you know very well, European Union contracts. So I would say that it's quite easy to find to finance postdocs because there's such a demand of lawyers being interested or uh, in command of tech aspects but the permanent positions those are the ones that are of course very attractive but also quite difficult to launch we have one up up now right now actually we are, we are looking for a researcher uh, sorry a lecturer in, in law and it mm -hmm. so we'll see what happens yeah and is it, and i would assume that it's then probably relatively difficult to find postdocs because they have alternatives on the on the free market and 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 are better paid and there is no no need to write a second book and all this and then then but then again there are advantages there are still um curious uh mm -hmm. young researchers not necessarily uh, age old but junior uh, researchers and um yeah so you still find interesting people it's not really a crisis at the moment at least it's still, no it's still not true. it's not yeah. i think I'm, i was quite when i read went through the latest application pile up applications um it was i was quite uh impressed very qualified um candidates actually yeah and is it mainly a domestic market or is the swedish labor market in academia open to non-swedish applicants it's indeed open to non-Swedish applicants. We have, um, I think the whole faculty had a bit over 100 applications uh, now, uh, this spring uh, as, uh, candidates for, for uh, the position as a doctoral student. Mm -hmm. And I don't have the exact figures, but quite a few come from, from, from abroad, so to speak, outside of, of, of Sweden. So it's a very, very global um, doctoral uh, education so to speak yeah and it would not be a problem for i don't know a german or a french um, to become a professor and then to teach swedish students in a legal system they never studied on their own that is uh definitely a challenge it, whether it's at all um possible and it's also something uh, that the department and the faculty is struggling with uh because the uh, the positions conventionally are based on on uh, the lecturer, the postdoc, uh, doing quite a lot of hours uh, teaching, and, and how do you match that in terms of of the Swedish language? And and to some extent, positions are conditioned that the person in question uh, must sign up for, well, in, in one or two years, I will be able to teach in Swedish. But still, you have the lack of knowledge of the Swedish uh, system, even though there are courses. But it's you're pointing out at, uh, at a problem, at a challenge. Maybe mm -hmm. we shouldn't say problem, but it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, probably the challenge is quite common in all European 
universities um, because you always are trying to find people who have an international background and at the same time you're trying to find people who are able to teach local students in local legal systems mm -hmm. and there is a contradiction in this obviously obviously but let's perhaps come back to the uh to the changes that that are triggered by, or are not triggered by this crisis at the moment so um if i if i were now at the university and i i i were somewhere in my postdoc uh, position and i i see now all this coming and all this happening as it is at the moment do you think that i would need to fear that uh, my day-to-day -day work um, as a university teacher will, will change due to this crisis in the near future? Or should I hope that it will change? Or, or sh should I expect that it stays like it was before March of this year? It has already changed, hmm. I would say. And uh, I mean, we just, uh, I mean, the, the number of, the, the, the environment is, is so the map and the environment is so different now. And I was, um, for this interview, I thought about BYOD, bring your own device, mm -hmm. which was quite topical, um, I don't know, a decade ago, uh, when people were bringing uh, both physical hardware, I mean, the smartphones and the laptops, etc., to work and also using your private accounts, email, mail accounts and then all different other accounts at workplace. And um, that gives rise to quite a few questions. I mean, to what extent is it is it legally uh, okay to use different kinds of tools? What we see, I think, I think that discussion is coming back. Uh, how do you divide the public and the private life? What can you do with your tools and accounts? What should you do? What what can you say no to? Uh, so I think we need to once again talk about bringing your own device. And I just to calculate it myself, and I, I came to the uh, number that I am uh, as employed at, at Stockholm University, I'm supposed to be in command of, let's say, I think it was 15 different platforms, mm -hmm. um, Zoom, Slack, uh, Teams, and uh, you name it. And then there are university specific platforms as well. And, and the digital divide comes into the picture, not necessarily uh, from a student point of view, naturally, because quite a few students, students are young and have more or less been grow, growing up on the internet. Um, but I would say within staff, it's, it's not that easy uh, being in command of all these tools. And sometimes they work, sometimes you picture they're upside down, sometimes the connection is bad, you cannot hear it. And uh, that's, could, that could be very stressful. So I think we possibly have... Um, some issues to discuss and and how do we how do we make the workplace um safe not only from an information security point of view but also tool wise yeah that's i mean there are so many very interesting aspects in your answer um so, so to start with first uh, when i think about the digital divide and the students i think one of the uh, one of the things that i clearly see is that uh the poorer you are the, the worse your chances are to get through this uh, set specific semester with good success rates because you, you are sitting somewhere at home without your own laptop. Uh, the internet connection is bad. Mm -hmm. There are three other people in the apartment, each of them needing to do something and so on. You don't, you don't have any kind of contact with your teachers and so on. So I think there is, as far as I can see it, and I think there is also quite some research done, in particular at my university, by the way, showing quite clearly that uh, this is something which segregates uh, the rich from the poor um, in, when it comes to the students in particular. Um, and when it comes to the teachers, I think um, I, I completely share your view that there are teachers who are able or at least willing to adapt to this situation. And there are others who are not. And, and then there's a third group, which is neither willing to adapt to the new situation nor to adapt to the alternative old one because they are at the same time in, in a risk group, right? So those who are not able or not willing to adapt to the new technologies and at the same time not willing or not able to teach in presence because uh, that is dangerous to them. Uh, and, and that is also very challenging when it comes to faculty politics then how to you know how to deal with both aspects the student side and the and the staff side i would be very interested to hear from you how how your university is doing this at the moment 
Um, I think at the beginning of the corona crisis, there was more or less entirely focus on keeping the students safe and being able to produce credits. Hmm. I saw very little of legal considerations, legal assessments of all the legal implications associated with using Zoom, um, data protection, uh, principles of openness, records management. Uh, you can make the list very long. Mm -hmm. And uh, that it surprises me that issues that we were investigating for weeks and months before, and it was legally impossible to do that, and it was impossible to, to do that. But but then suddenly it was as if, if all the law was gone. Now, it's, that's a bit of a dramatic way of describing things, but the legal aspects were not there. It was just purely functional. Get it up, get it up and running. And we had at the department, we had four, four different, four, I think, but four laptops, and I don't know how many hundreds we are, but but that's that's the sidetrack. My my impression and my 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 concern is that there was, and I still see very little legal consideration of this transfer into the platform, a platform environment, and I think also then the digital uh, divide. In addition to what you bring into the picture, the poor, the poor students, I I would also see that the old the differences. I mean, see change your hierarchies now between the 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 young staff, the younger staff, and the and the older staff, and and that that causes tension. It's quite interesting. I would say from from a work work life perspective is, uh, so the um, uh, employer says that. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I shouldn't be on campus. I should stay at home. But at home, I, I should carry out my legal tasks, but I'm not provided with tools for doing so. So, um, and how does that affect my quality of work if I don't have a webcam, if, if I don't, you know, have the fast internet, for instance, what will be the quality of my work in comparison with the colleague? And how does that affect my, my, my chances of promotion? So what happened to what happened to all the law? Uh, that's a very good question. But uh, perhaps to the first part of your assessment, don't you think that this is the typical situation as we saw it already before the crisis when it comes to regulating uh, information technology by legal means? I mean, this uh, isn't that exactly what people like you and me have been complaining about for years now, that the law is always too late, that it's always too complex, that it's always too national always to whatsoever technology uh, uh, out fashioned. Um, and, and that is just now a lot clearer because it happened so much quicker. Is there really a change in this? Is it true that the law disappeared or was it just clear more, I mean, cle really clearly visible this time that uh, we are over exaggerating the impact of legal instruments on how a society develops? I'm not ready to give up law that easily. I still think that uh, we need the law, we need the proactive law, and uh, but what we shouldn't be afraid of the law. I mean, when I hear quite a lot, when we were, we had a very intense discussion in Sweden about the e uh, e apps and uh, for the tracing and spreading and all that, and um, it was so quickly uh, concluded that um, it was so quickly concluded that. How shall I put it? It was um, quickly concluded that the, the problem was the secrecy legislation, the rules about confidentiality. But but for for, for God's sake, why don't prepare a, a government bill? Why don't not prepare the bill to the parliament and have the parliament in a democratic way making decisions? Mm -hmm. So the 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 law became some 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 something to 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 be blamed for. So I don't. I'm not, yeah, give up to some extent the conventional law, but that's not similar to, to giving up law. No, but that's not, I did not really call um, for giving up the law. It was Sorry. just about, no, 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 I would not do that being a lawyer. It was more the uh, um, a kind of um, an attempt to understand what the law was able or was not able to achieve prior to the crisis and whether there's any change in this, in particular when it comes to regulating technology. So I think the argument one could make is 
it's not really a completely new phenomenon that uh, law is not very good in regulating uh, the development of technology. And, that, and, and this is simply more clearly visible now because it happened so quickly and but so then patrically. It, mm -hmm. But then again, law does not have to be regulations. Law could be uh, so much more in terms of soft law and in terms Indeed. of test mm -hmm. beds, in terms of... Um, those kind of solutions, but it was that it was on the one hand, it was conventional legal reflections about ap applicable secrecy legislation. And then on the other side, there was nothing but that I think that that's, uh, that's a risk and that's not the best solution, we should have other kinds of, of law into into bringing that to the discussions it was uh, the corona showed also that there is a need to be prepared so that the, when the crisis come it, it it it's not acceptable to to start to begin with the first step we should all we should do our homework so that we are prepared when the crisis if the crisis comes mm -hmm. and well, so then let's do our homework. Uh, both of us don't know how exactly uh, September will look like or December will look like. Uh, and both of us will need to teach next term and our universities will need to organize something for next term. So what would you expect your university to do? And what would you expect you to do now in order to be prepared for the possible next wave if there is any in autumn? Or for the next big thing, whatever it might be in a year or in three? Of course, that's uh, a quest question uh, not possible to answer, but I would expect and I honestly also appreciate very much the way in which uh, the head of the department and the faculty has been very open minded, very supportive. So in spite of criticism that I brought forward, I still say that it's very understandable and and so that's uh, hu human wise, good, uh, a good um thing then then what is needed well then we're of course back to where we started and the the uh the situation in sweden and i do hope that this uh, new commission um that is chaired by the supreme court judge um prior a supreme court judge will investigate and explain and shed light on how could it happen so that sweden learns its lessons hmm. in the future. Hmm. And and you personally, you are preparing for a for for a semester in fall that is uh, open to both options. Or we are uh, required to prepare for the first courses in the autumn fall to be uh, completely digital. Mm -hmm. And so do you do you have the feeling that your students support this or or? Is there, are students asked by the way, or is it, how, how are those decisions taken? I, I don't really have the overview, but I know that uh, we are now planning also for the special courses, not, I mean, we have the first one the, for the undergraduates, but then it's just mm -hmm. up and running. But then when it comes to the special courses, uh, we receive more questions from the practicing lawyers that we bring in. They wonder, okay, if, they wanna, if we are going to record uh, your uh, lecture, how, how much, will we earn and how do you calculate in terms of lectures, digital, lots of preparation, but not maybe that many minutes up in the air. Mm -hmm. So those kind of underlying um, back office organizational issues, I think we're going to have quite a few, a few ones coming ahead because there was, I mean, during the crisis, people were very much oriented to solve the problems, the problem today, the problem tomorrow. Uh, possibly we'll, we'll have more, um, uh, complex issues, I mean, the, the basis for uh, fees, etc. So it's not going to be over uh, organization-wise. And of course, when it comes to corona, I'm not a medical specialist. I'm not, I'm not in that area. So it's just uh, my personal reflections, nothing else, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, I mean, all of us have become corona experts in some way <laughs> because it affects us so much in our, in our daily life, right? So... Uh, yeah. That, that certainly is an outcome of all this. Um, but again, perhaps another, uh, another uh, part of this question might have been um, in how far uh, your, your, I mean, the university, uh, oh, let's put it like this, you, 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 you stressed very much before that there is a difference in how teachers 
adapt to the new situation and that there is some kind of competition between uh, among the, the teachers and, and all this. Um, and that the, uh, this debate will not be over um, until September, obviously. So, but who is going to, to guide us through this debate? Is it, is it, I mean, is this something each university should try to find a solution for independently? Or, or do you think that the country should deal with this? Or is it even a European issue that all of us need to talk about? I, I, I look, of course, I'm not going to provide you with an, with an answer, but what does strike my mind is what will the CPDP conference be like in January? Computers, privacy, and data protection, this huge international conference about, well, yeah. privacy issues. Uh, and I'm a bit curious, how will that be arranged? It used, it was last year, I think there was six, six different tracks, huge conference. And I think that's going to be an interesting um, environment for understanding different moves, tendencies. I'm 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 just open to to all kinds of of development. One thing, if I might come back to uh, something that from from a researcher's point of view, and and the frustration that when I began with the project, that was we focus on the normal society, and then. Uh, it turned out to be a mix of the normal society and the uh, corona society. And that made me go back. I don't think, I, let me know if I talked about it before, but uh, the fact that in 1973, Sweden was first to launch a National Data Protection Act. Uh, and then we adjusted to the Data Protection Directive and now GDPR. And at the, during the 1970s, that regulation focused on uh, uh, un inappropriate uh, infringements of privacy, mm -hmm. as opposed to appropriate infringements uh, of privacy. And that was something that was to some extent was discussed in Sweden for a couple of decades ago, when there was very much emphasis on on uh, on, on record linkages, etc. And and maybe from a researcher's point of view, we'll experience uh, that old questions will come up again. How much privacy, how much data protection can we afford in a society um, uh, that is governed by uh, so many uncertainties and so much crisis like the Swedish, um, the Swedish situation? And those very difficult questions, I think we should discuss also, mm. how much how much privacy and what about the openness? What about the fundamental uh, principles of freedom of information, etc.? So, my hopes are that we will not avoid the really difficult questions, both as a teacher conveying that to the students, but also within within the teachers' community or educational community. Yeah. Um... When when we talk about openness, I mean you you mentioned before that the decision was taken that you that you stream your teaching mainly via Zoom, mm -hmm. which which probably means that uh, this is for students only, right? So there is no no access for non students to the to the normal class. No, that that's that's yeah. But but then we have this yes yes. Yeah, and, and students have to pay. And and is there any? And I mean, uh, is there any discussion about the fees if it's only? I mean, uh, now I, honestly, I, I'm uncertain. I wasn't aware about because teaching and education is for free. Free, so they don't. Oh, so there's no uh, payment. No. No, there. But there is a very special agreement. Uh, not very special. There is an agreement between university and and Zoom. Mm -hmm. But all education, uh, higher education, is all free in Sweden. So. Okay, even if I do a, a, a highly specialized master, I don't need to pay as a student. It's all free. Yeah, and, yeah, okay. yeah, there, there are so, no master fees. Okay, and why is then not everything broadcast on the internet, simply on the open internet? Why is it then students only? Um, I, I suppose that's the outcome of the uh, negotiations. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't know the details, yeah. but... Yeah. Uh, but there has been discussions about including pictures uh, from a data protection point of view. 
Hmm. What about students that have some issues that they want to have that exposed? What about um, the digital exams uh, and having some guards? Because in a, in a physical location, you have also someone checking out what goes on. Yeah. And can can we do that in a Zoom environment? What does that imply in terms of data protection? Mm -hmm. So I would also expect the conventional legal issues not popping up, but they will, they will, I mean, there's just, and also the right of access, Article 15 GDPR. Um, mm. What about the administration? The Yeah, so the long list of, of legal rules. Yeah, and the interesting problems are right ahead of us. They are not behind us. They are right ahead of us. I completely mm. share your, your view on this. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so Cecilia, perhaps to, to ask a very last question from my side before I open the floor for all the questions that I should have asked uh, and, and that you would have liked to answer. My, my very last question would be, if uh, if I if you if you happen to t share with me what the specific legal interest you will have in the next two or three years because of the COVID nineteen crisis will be so what is your personal priority what what people with your background and you in particular should deal with um, in the next two or three years in particular um, after these months of experience with this crisis what would it be uh, I do not expect myself to engage into the broad, the wide area of e-health, mm -hmm. but I see that as unavoidable uh, because it's it's important to bring in a, a legal perspective, not necessarily whether a certain data category qualifies as being sensitive or health data, but rather in terms of procedures the way uh, the, the test beds, how, how could that be carried out in, in, in practice? Mm -hmm. And why, and, and also the procedural lawmaking, why, I mean, how can you speed it up, but still make it in compliance with the rule of law? So personally, I will, I, I, I think I will, um, or, I will work with eHealth, and I'm currently engaged in in um, in a quite uh, comprehensive project, Data Leash. It's a co collaboration between the Technical High School and uh, the University of Stockholm, among others. And the acronym is Data Leash, and it's it's about uh, having your data in a leash when you think you go out with your dog if you have a dog mm -hmm. to walk, and that depending on the circumstances you can expand the leash or you could uh, contract it. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the, that kind of research in an e-health environment, I hope I'll be able to dig into. Okay, so very much looking forward to reading fr from <laughs> you again um, on this. Um, and I completely share your view that the health part is really one of the most challenging parts of our 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 field um, at the mm -hmm. moment, and one of the most rewarding ones at the same time. Uh, Cecilia, what should I have asked? Is there anything that I should have asked? Hmm. Anything you want to share with the audience at the end? You made so many points in your questioning, so um, I'm 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 pretty I'm pretty happy, but I'm afraid yeah. I haven't been able to provide precise answers. But it's no, been very no, no. inspiring sharing yeah. views with you. Thank you, thank you very much. I mean, this is not about position. This is more about you know, it's about problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know getting a better understanding of what yeah. we don't know right this is about uh, identifying the the known unknowns in comparison with the unknown unknowns and i very much appreciate your your impact on this and your input on this um i i found it very very useful um thank you cecilia for this uh it was most rewarding and most interesting thank you to our audience uh, for uh, staying with us have a good evening stay safe and stay healthy Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.